Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spurs Up Show, the best Gamecocks podcast on the internet. Today is Thursday, August the 6th, 2020. On today's show, we continue along with the position at preview series today. We're talking the Gamecocks linebackers heading into 2020 season. I'll take a look back at 2019. We'll meet the linebackers, talk about who has the most to prove, best overall. Season will be successful if I'll give my overall grade much, much more there as well. Also, Will Muschamp speaks to the media on Wednesday afternoon. I'll give my thoughts on some of his comments, some very, very interesting stuff coming from his comments to the media. We do have some news and notes to get into as well. Your listener questions and a fantastic interview. Former Gamecocks ball player in front of the show, Savell Newton joins the show. We're going to break down his entire career, get his thoughts on this whole COVID madness, uh, and look ahead to the 2020 season. So really glad to have Savell back on the show. It's an awesome interview. You guys stay tuned for that. It's all brought to you by our friends over at SeatGeek. SeatGeek, the best ticket buying app by far, the only ticket buying app I use, and the only one I recommend. Go download the SeatGeek app or go to SeatGeek.com. Use the promo code SPURSUP. You're going to save $20 off your first purchase. Guys, sports are back. We've been watching baseball games every single night, so we've got MLB, NBA is on every single night, college football is on its way back, NFL is on its way back. Sports are back. Fans are going to be in the seats. I think Ray Tanner said last week north of 20,000 or so should make their way into Williams-Brice Stadium. Whatever you need your tickets to, though, once we're able to go back to events, which, like I said, fingers crossed, is sooner rather than later, you want to make sure you have the best ticket-buying app possible. Because, listen, nobody's going to scalp tickets anymore. You're not going to come in contact with anybody. You're not going to scalp tickets. Doing it all mobile, doing it through your phone, doing it through apps is going to be the way to go 110%. So you want to make sure you have the best possible one. SeatGeek is it. They have a great ticket rating system which rates the tickets for you based on the type of deal you're getting. So guys, never again do you have to worry about, again, scalping. But when you buy the tickets, more importantly, you're going to know exactly where you're sitting, what you're paying for those tickets, and what type of deal you're getting. Like I said, are you getting a good deal? Are you getting ripped off? What's the person next to you paying? Where am I sitting? How is my view? You're going to know everything you need to know up front so you can make the purchase. You can have that peace of mind when you click the buy button to know, hey, I'm going to have a good time. I'm getting the best bang for my buck. I'm saving myself the most money. So you can just go simply enjoy your event. It's literally that simple. And also, we're going to save you 20 bucks in the process. So again, that's our friends at SeatGeek. Go download the SeatGeek app or go to SeatGeek.com. Use the promo code SPURSUP, that's S-P-R-S-U-P, to save $20 off your first purchase. Let's get it. Appreciate you guys tuning in. We have got a pack show, lot to get to, a lot of football talk on this show today, and it feels great because as we creep, slowly creep closer and closer to the start of college football season, it feels good. You can feel that that energy that I, I feel energized today. I feel very, very energized because, again, we're starting to get pressers again. We're about to get the SEC schedule. I thought we were going to get it Wednesday afternoon. Seems like we have not, so we're probably going to get it Thursday, but we should have it by the end of the week. Football is in motion, though. Football is in motion. We have a start date for fall camp, which I'm going to get into a little bit later. It feels good. It feels good. Football, again, is slowly on its way back, and I, for one, am fired up about it. I know you are as well, and again, this is a football-heavy show today. Again, as we get closer and closer and closer, what are we, 51 days now until kickoff with the updated kickoff date, so... I'm fired up as ever for it. I am fired up as ever, and I appreciate you guys tuning in today. Before we get into everything, really, really quickly, as always, if you have not done so, take five seconds, click the pause button. Hey, we're 10 reviews away on iTunes from 300. I would love to hit that 300 mark. So take five seconds, click the pause button, go leave your thoughts, your feedback, whether you like the show, you hate the show, you like me, you hate me, you have some suggestions, whatever it is. That's a great place to do it, but if you have five seconds, go leave five stars, whether you're on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play. does not matter. matter. helps boost up the podcast for those that maybe you're unfamiliar with the Spurs Up show. It helps boost up the podcast, so I would really appreciate it, and those who have already done so, thank you so much. Also, 
If you're listening to the show and you're not subscribed, I'm not sure what you're doing, hammer that subscribe button, follow across social media. You guys know what to do. And again, I, I assume most of you, if not all of you are already subscribed. So thank you so much again for that and for your support as well. Also, big piece of news. I know people have probably been wondering where have the Twitch streams gone as soon as the schedule drops, which should be at the end of this week. Hell, when you're listening to this, it might have already dropped. But I am planning on starting the NCAA football 14 streams next week. I'm planning on starting those next week. So you guys stay tuned for that. I'm very, very, very excited about those. So stay tuned for that. Stay tuned for the details, but the Twitch content is going to come back. Also, just want to shamelessly plug this again. Rowdy Rooster Radio, we've been doing it every day. Did not have Rowdy Rooster Radio on Wednesday afternoon due to the interview you're going to hear with Savelle Newton. That sort of took priority over that. Um, and honestly, guys, this first week has been sort of a sort of a trial and error run, if you will. As you can obviously hear if you've tuned in, the audio quality isn't fantastic right now. I'm still working with blogtalkradio.com to get them to fix that. So I can promise you week two of Rowdy Rooster Radio is going to be much, much more organized, put together. But so far, I've had a lot of fun with it. I think it's been a big success. And again, it's going to get more amped up and it's going to get more I think intense as we get closer to football season for sure. But you guys be sure to tune in that Monday through Friday, every single day, four to 6 PM. There's a call in number as well. Um, it's a lot of fun, very interactive, a lot of fun, always a lot to talk about, not just talking Gamecocks either sec, but I was talking Braves the other day. Um, was talking last chance. You We're going to be talking professional sports. We're going to be talking common, common interest topics, a little bit of everything. So you guys tune in rowdy rooster radio, Monday through Friday, four to 6 PM. Very, very, very excited for that piece of content and how that's going to evolve as we get closer to football season as well. Uh, all right, let's dive right into it. The position unit preview series. We're almost done with these. We're actually almost done with these. Um, we have linebackers left and defensive backs, and that's it. We've literally got one more after this. So um, we're talking Gamecocks linebackers today, a very, very interesting position on the South Carolina defense. Like I've said before, I'm very high on this South Carolina defense heading into the 2020 football season. I think by far this is Will Muschamp's best unit defensively. I think there's a ton of athleticism. For whatever reason, the linebackers have seemed to be a consistent question mark under Will Muschamp. Um, let's take a look back first at 2019. Taking a look at the stats, you know, Ernest Jones leading the team in total tackles, and I thought he was a guy that really broke out last year. 97 total tackles. Five and a half tackles for loss. He had a, a sack on the year as well. Had two picks. Had a forced fumble. He was a playmaker for you. And, and I think I was sort of surprised. Not surprised in the, in the sense of, like, he has the ability. But I think we all expected T.J. Expected Brunson as the senior to, the, the, you know, their stats to be reversed, I guess you could say. T.J. Brunson, I mean, a very respectable year. 77 total tackles. Six tackles for loss. Uh, didn't record a sack, but did have an interception and a fumble recovery as well. So, again – what you expect from the senior playmaker. But really, to me, Ernest Jones was the one that sort of made a huge splash. I mean, almost 100 tackles in a year. That is getting after it. That is absolutely getting after it. So, Ernest Jones leading the way. You take a look down the list, though. Other guys that made a contribution, Sherrod Green, who's had a very interesting career at South Carolina for sure. Uh, huge drop-off, 35 total tackles. So, you had Ernest Jones and T.J. Brunson at 97 and 77. You go all the way down to Sherrod Green, 35 total tackles. He had six and a half tackles for loss, half a sack, um, two quarterback hurries. Keep going down. Damani Staley, 22 total tackles, two tackles for loss. Let's see what else. Um, that was it for him. Danny Fennell, who came in and out of that position a little bit, 15 total tackles, three tackles for loss. Um, and then Jamar Brown, a guy we're going to talk about, six total tackles on the year uh, in his freshman season, one tackle for loss for Jamar Brown. So, and that pretty much rounds it out. You had some other guys that played sparingly, like Rosendo Lewis, three total tackles, one tackle for loss. Um, Eldridge Thompson had three tackles. Spencer Easton Riddle had six tackles. So, you had other guys that played a little bit here and there, but the main guys at the top are Ernest Jones, TJ Brunson, Sherrod Green. Um, you know, you're going to be depending on all those guys outside of TJ Brunson, who is now in the NFL. So, uh, really interesting group. Again, I think there's still questions with this group. But there's certainly not a lack of talent. I think all over the defense, like I've said about every defensive position, there's not a lack of talent, I feel like, on the defense. Um, let's meet the linebackers heading into the 2020 football season. You start out, sophomore Jamar Brown, senior Spencer Eason Riddle, senior Sherrod Green, junior Ernest Jones, freshman Mohamed Kaba, sophomore Rosendo Lewis Jr., junior Sean McGonigal, senior Damani Staley, sophomore Noah Vincent, freshman Daryl Ware, and senior 
Donovan work. So there is some veteran, there's some veteran guys there. I mean, you think about it. There are veteran guys in this linebacker core. Again, Ernest Jones, the junior. Sherrod Green's a senior now. Um, you know, Damani Staley's a senior now. So you have some veteran experienced guys, but really the question we all know is replacing the production of TJ Brunson. Who, who's going to be that number two linebacker, if you will? Um, so let's dive right into that. Most approved, best overall season will be successful if, and I'll give my overall grade for the unit as well. You guys know how we do it. Let's start with the most approved. And, you know, I just kind of harped on how much experience you have at the linebacker position. But for me, the most approved, and, you know, I talked about one of the guys earlier, and they're two young guys. I think there's two young guys. Because, listen, just off the jump, I think you know Ernest Jones and Sherrod Green are two of your starting linebackers. Like That's not a secret to anybody. Those two guys are going to be your starting linebackers. They've, they've played a lot of good football for you. Ernest Jones, obviously, I think is – going to be one of the best linebackers in the SEC, and I'll talk about him a little bit more in just a second. But, you know, I think Sherrod Green is a player that, listen, his sophomore year, he was not very good. I mean, there's no other way to put it. He was not very good. I thought he took a big jump last year for South Carolina. I was looking back at last year. Going into last season, Sherrod Green was my guy that I said had the most to prove among the linebackers, and I thought he played well. Listen, did he play great? No, I'm not going to say he played great, but I thought he played well. I thought he had a better season for South Carolina. So I think you know, no doubt, Ernest Jones and Sherrod Green are going to be your two starting linebackers. So to me, the most to prove and who has to step up for South Carolina, one of these two dudes, I couldn't narrow it down to one guy, one of these two dudes, one of these two young cats has to step up for South Carolina at the other linebacker spot, and that is Jamar Brown and Mo Kaba. Jamar Brown and Mo Kaba. Like I said, Jamar Brown played a little bit last year. Mo Kaba, a true freshman. You take a look at their measurables, though. Um, you take a look at their measure. Jamar Brown, 6'1", 205, and Mo Kaba as a true freshman, 6'2", 220. So some very, very good size on those guys. Listen, you know, it's tough to ask young players to come in and play a ton of snaps in the SEC. That, that No matter the position, there's few guys that can really do it and do it successfully. But this is why you recruit, right? These are the type of guys that you need to hit on in recruiting. You just simply put, you've had some misses at the linebacker position. I think specifically of a guy, Rosendo Lewis. I don't know what's happened to Rosendo. Like, I'd love to see a guy like Rosendo Lewis fill the other linebacker spot, but I can't depend on it. I, I just can't. I, I don't know what's happened to him. I don't know what the deal is, but I simply can't depend on him. So you're going to need a young guy to step up at this other position. Now, could a guy like a Damani Staley possibly fit in? Maybe so. But I think overall, talent-wise, the the ceiling – for the guys, I think you're looking at guys like Jamar Brown and Mo Cobb. And Mo, these are both guys that were very highly regarded and very much hyped coming into South Carolina. So, again, a lot of you have asked me, by the way, over the different position groups, Chris, why are you putting a freshman or a young player as, as someone who has the most to prove? Why are you not putting a veteran guy? Well, here's the thing. A lot of these freshmen – their ceiling – like, experience isn't everything. It's a great thing, but it's not everything. There's a lot of young guys on our team that have much higher ceilings than some of our older veteran guys. It just bottom line. I think Damani Staley, listen, I think he's a nice piece. I think he's a solid piece. I think he's a guy that'll be in the rotation. But when I look at a guy like when I look at guys like Jamar Brown and Mokaba, I think simply their ceiling is higher. And if they play up to their capabilities, they will be in the starting three. So I think these two young guys both need to step up. Listen, like I said, these are the type of guys that you need to hit on in recruiting. You bring in these type of guys to play, to make a contribution for you, to be impact guys. And like I said, I know it's asking a lot of these guys to play so early. But listen, Jamar Brown played last year, got his feet wet, played nine games for South Carolina. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's not a puppy anymore. He, he played a lot last year. And again, Mo Kaba, I know he's a true freshman, a guy with a ton of hype coming into South Carolina. So, the most to prove for me, it's two youngsters, but Jamar Brown and Mo Cobb, I think both guys that the sky is the limit for them as far as their career at South Carolina, but the Gamecocks need them to be the dudes they recruited them to be right now and play right now and make an impact right now for this defense. Um, best overall, listen, it's no shock. It's Ernest Jones. It's not even close. It's Ernest Jones. I talked about a little bit earlier in the show, Ernest Jones – I am very excited for Ernest Jones. I, listen, I think Ernest Jones is a star in the making. I, I really believe Ernest Jones is a star in the making. I think he's the next great linebacker at South Carolina. Um, 
you know, I think he's a dude that maybe doesn't get talked about quite as much as some of the other linebackers in the SEC. And, you know, I know he's been sprinkled in here and there among some uh, all SEC teams and stuff like that. But the dude just has a knack for the ball. He's a solid overall player. There's nothing I, – I feel like maybe he's not great at one thing, but he has no deficiencies. I, I don't feel like Ernest Jones as a linebacker has many deficiencies, if any. So, I think Ernest Jones – is a star in the making for this South Carolina defense. You know, he, he's he, – I mean, you saw him last year as a sophomore lead the team in total tackles. I, I think he 100% does that again. I think he might even hit the 100 total tackle mark this year, had 97 last year. Again, playing just in just 10 games, though, probably going to be pretty tough to hit that mark. But either way, I fully expect him to lead this team in tackles. I think, again, Ernest Jones is one of your best players on defense as a whole, period. Um, not just your best linebacker, one of your best defensive players – period. And I think this is going to be a guy that's going to be one of your captains of the defense. You know, TJ Brunson was that guy last year, obviously being the senior, but now Ernest Jones, I think, is the juniors going to fill in that role. And he's certainly the captain of the linebackers. I think he's going to be one of your captains, one of your leaders on that defense. I'm so excited to see what Ernest Jones has in store for his third year, because again, I mean, the first two, he has really shown himself. He has really proved himself as far as being one of those dudes you can depend on every single Saturday. So again, No question in my mind, Ernest Jones, the best overall linebacker on this South Carolina roster. Um, Season will be successful if. Season will be successful if. So this one was kind of interesting because I'm not really attaching anything statistically to it. Um, I'm not attaching anything statistically to this for a successful season. But, you know, the biggest thing that I want to see from these Gamecock linebackers it's just simply more consistency. Uh, just just more consistency. You know, listen, the linebackers we all know are the weakness of the defense. They have been the weakness of the defense, it seems like, for the past couple of years. And like I said, I think they got better last year. I, I really think they got better, which was kind of crazy to think because they lost Sky Moore to the NFL. But I definitely thought they were more consistent with Brunson, with Sherrod Green, with Ernest Jones. I thought you saw much, much more consistent play from those guys. But I just want to see more from them. You know what I mean? Like, I still feel like there are times, uh, whether it's gap control or whether it's just honestly simply just making a tackle that, uh, you know, these guys miss on. So, and especially I, I want to see more consistency in pass coverage as well. I want to see more consistency in pass coverage. That's been a big issue as well, guys covering guys over the middle. Um, so, listen, I think you have the talent. Like I said, I think Ernest Jones is absolutely a star in the making. I think he'll be one of the better – defensive players one of the more underrated defensive players in the SEC but just be more consistent because I feel like there are times it's especially and it shows in the stat sheet you know when you're giving up 158 yards per game rushing and like I said I didn't really want to attach a statistical number to these guys because listen it's not just the linebackers to blame for a lot of these stats it, it, it's not just the linebackers to blame right um, but I think if you see the linebackers be more consistent and you see these young guys evolve, and you see Ernest Jones play like we know he can play, and you see Sherrod Green continue to develop and, become again, become a more consistent player, you're going to see the statistics get better. You're going to see the statistics get better. Now, you know what would really help this linebacker group is the defensive line to pan out and play the way we think they're going to play. So there's a lot of factors in it, but simply put, for me, the season will be successful if the linebackers can just be more consistent for the South Carolina defense. Um, Overall grade for these guys. Overall grade, like I said, I I have not given anyone on the defense below a B yet. This is going to be my first time doing it, though. Even with Ernest Jones, as good as he is, um, you know, when you're taking a look at the other linebacking corps in the SEC, I've got to be – I've got to be honest with these guys, and I've got to be blunt with these guys. And I think right now a C-minus feels like the right grade for the linebacking group. I mean, listen, Ernest Jones, fantastic player. I think there's a major drop-off when you go to Sherrod Green. And then your third spot, you're depending on two guys who are extremely unproven and they're young. So, um, listen, Damani Staley's a nice role player. You have other guys that are nice role players. Maybe Rosendo Lewis can figure it out this year if he's fully healthy. But um, a lot of question marks. And, I mean, listen, this is the biggest question mark on the South Carolina defense and one of the biggest question marks on this entire team. So, you know, I don't think that's going to come as a shock to anyone. I don't think that's going to come as a surprise to anyone. I mean, listen, we've been talking about linebackers, I feel like, for the past – Five years, man. It just it feels like we've been talking about linebackers forever. So I'm going to give them a C minus. I think the potential is there, obviously, to exceed that grade, no question. I mean, Ernest Jones alone holds this holds this group up, but you got to see something outside of Ernest Jones. Again, Sherrod Green is going to be a starter. He's a solid player. 
but he didn't do anything to wow me last year. Again, 35 tackles. He did have six and a half tackles for loss, was getting in the backfield a decent amount for South Carolina, but can he step up and take on a much, much bigger role for the defense? Can those young guys develop? So there's just questions at the linebacker spot. So again, I'm going to give him a grade of C minus. I think the potential is there to obviously exceed that, but C minus for me feels right right now. So again, that is the linebackers heading into the 2020 football season. Again, biggest question mark on the defense, but I do certainly think, you know, they could become – I think South Carolina can at least be average at the linebacker spot. I don't think South Carolina has to be below average at linebacker. I think they can be good enough to help support the rest of this defense to where the defense can still thrive and be successful. So, um, yeah, that's the wrap on the linebacker. All right, let's talk about this Will Muschamp presser. Will Muschamp speaking to the media – on Wednesday afternoon, and he had some very, very, very interesting comments, no question. Um, let's dive right into it. So, two offensive linemen for the Gamecocks have decided to opt out, Mark Fox and Jordan Rhodes, opting out for the 2020 season due to the coronavirus pandemic. And I know a lot of people ask me, who are these guys? Will they play? Uh, maybe some that don't keep up as closely, will those guys play? Jordan Rhodes, absolutely. Um, Jordan Rhodes was – no doubt battling for a position on the offensive line, most likely at the guard position, and was at worst a guy who was going to factor in the rotation. So, you know, listen, the guys want to opt out. That's completely fine. That's their choice, and I'm not holding it against them for sure. Nobody should. You shouldn't hold it against them. If you don't feel safe, do not play. I agree with that 100%. But, you know, definitely going to hurt from a depth standpoint when you lose a guy like Jordan Rhodes. That's definitely going to hurt from a depth standpoint. So, um you know, it's really just next man up mentality at this point. That's really all you can do if you're the Gamecocks. Um, let's see. Next thing up, of course, Luke Doty. Oh, man, Luke Doty has been the popular man as far as conversation goes the past few days, really since the weekend. Luke Doty, the wide receiver. Luke Doty's running routes. Blah, blah, blah. And I've been very, you know, listen, I'm like, official practice hadn't even started yet. I, I'm all t I'm taking it all with a grain of salt. There, there's nothing really that I, I'm going to buy into right now. I'm, I'm not going to bite at it. You know what I mean? I'm going to wait and see. Um, I'm like, how, how do you know he's been working out at wide out when practice has not even started? Will Muschamp asked about it today, of course, and did give a little bit of an insight. And this is what he said. This is via Mike Yuva, our good friend, Mike. Um, he said, Muschamp says Luke Doty is still a quarterback, but adds with his skill set, quote, He's a guy who is going to play some different things for us. So I think that all but confirms that Luke Doty is probably going to get somewhat of a look at wide receiver. You know, listen, I, I want the best 22 to play, right? I want the best 22 to play. I think this speaks to two things. Number one, the wide receiver room is a weakness. And, and that's not, I'm not like, I'm not, saying something you guys didn't already know. Hell, I gave the wide receiver the D-plus in a position in previews. We know it's a weakness, okay? We know that. So, I mean, I, I guess if you want to try to get one of your better athletes out there, outside, and see if he can make plays, fine. Again, it really just truly speaks to how weak the wide receiver position is. I mean, I, you know, you've already got two former quarterbacks at wide receiver. Now you're going to add a third? And to me, here's my other takeaway. So that's my first takeaway, that the wide receiver room is weak. We knew that. The other takeaway is that the coaches are set on Colin Hill and Ryan Helensky battling out the quarterback position, which we're going to talk about in just a second. But here is my biggest thing with it. I mean, listen, last season showed you you need a QB3. I mean, literally, last season showed it to you. Jake Bentley goes down, then Ryan Helensky's thrust in. Ryan Helensky, Ryan Helensky gets banged up. Dak Joyner had to play. So, I mean, having a QB3 is something you need to have. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I, I don't really know what to say about it because, again, I want the best 22 on the field. If he's that good of an athlete and can make plays on the outside, I, I mean, I know he played a little wide receiver in high school, whatever. Um, so be it. But I, I don't I just – it seems like a it seems like a strange move, you know what I mean? And like yeah, you know, it it seems like a strange move to me. And I don't know. We'll just see. We'll we'll just see. I think it also says to you too that you know this is not going to be a spread offense. That they're not going to put a guy back there like that who's athletic. Who, no, they're going to put him on the outside, and they're very comfortable with going the I formation with the like we've talked all off season sixty forty running the football. Um, 
So I, I think that's what it tells you about the offense as well, uh, which bleeds into and leads me into the last really big thing that Will Muschamp said, and it was about the quarterback competition. Mike Gillespie, another good buddy of mine, um, asked Will Muschamp, could Colin Hill start this year at the quarterback position? From Will Muschamp, quote, sure. We got great competition going on. So, sounds like we got us an open quarterback competition heading to fall camp, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> sounds like the quarterback competition is, any, is anything but decided. So, it, it'll be an interesting fall. I mean, listen. The, mo- the, the comments about Doty as well, that was the other point I want to make. I apologize. I, 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 for some reason, my mind went blank. The comments about Doty also say something else to me, that Colin Hill is at worst QB2, at worst at this point. And I've even heard rumblings he's been taking snaps with the ones. I, again, they're not, they're not legitimately practicing yet. So I take all of that with a grain of salt. When they start practicing, if we're getting those reports then, then there will be a little bit of – little bit of fire where there was smoke, right? But, um, yeah, I think it says definitely that Colin Hill is your QB2, at least, at least the QB2. So, I don't know, interesting, man. I mean, listen, they're the Colin Hill, the Colin Hill <sighs> hype train, I guess you could call it or whatever. I mean, it has caught a lot of steam over these last couple weeks. And I told you guys before when I talked about the quarterback position, I- I'm not going to be the guy – that goes out on that limb and, and proclaims that Colin Hill will take the starting quarterback job. I've said that I expect Ryan Helensky to be QB1. But again, like I said, I want the best 22 to play. So I think it's great to have competition. I think iron sharpens iron. And listen, we all know that Colin Hill knows the scheme and system better than Ryan Helensky. There's just no it's, – it's no knock on anybody else. It's no knock on Ryan. It's no knock on any quarterback in the room. I mean, Colin Hill has just been under Mike Bobo for years – He probably knows that playbook like the back of his hand. So, from that side of things, I certainly understand it. Um, But, you know, listen, iron sharpens iron. I mean, listen, I want the best guy to play. I don't care who is under center. Just Let's just play the best guy and let's win football games. That's all it comes down to. So, hey, if Colin Hill is that guy, and you would think, listen, I said last year, the reason Ryan Holinsky won the number two job and beat out Dak Joyner was purely because of his throwing ability, right? Well, from what I've seen on film, it seems like Colin Hill and Ryan Linsky's throwing ability are pretty on par with one another. They're pretty equal. So, all things being equal, if you have one guy who knows the playbook like the back of his hand and one guy who's just trying to learn the offense, I mean, if everything else is equal, you're going to play the guy that has more knowledge of the system, for sure. Especially, and again, you can have your opinions as far as you know, will Muschamp get canned because of the pandemic, blah, 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 whatever. That's completely fine. Um, you can have those thoughts. But this is still a big year. Like, this is still a very big year. Like, you need to show progress. You need to win now. So, you know, maybe they're thinking, hey, with this new offense, the guy who's experienced in the system gives us the best chance to win now. So, I don't know, very interesting stuff. He had other comments as well, but those are the big takeaways for me. I mean, very interesting stuff. And, you know, we'll see what happens. I mean, <laughs> it's going to be a very interesting offseason, a very, very fun fall camp. Uh, there's going to be a lot of storylines coming out because there are so many questions on, on this team. And, again, when you're a team coming off a four and eight year, every spot's open, basically. I mean, every single spot on the field is up for grabs. So, I think it's going to cause for a lot of competition, which, again, is a very good thing. Because, hey, you might see a guy like Ryan Linsky rise to the occasion. Sort of like we saw Jake Bentley do in 2017, or yeah, was it a uh, no? Excuse me, 2018, when Michael Skarnecchia took the job for a week. We I thought we saw Jake elevate his play, so it helps some guys. Maybe we'll see that. So it ought to be a lot of fun. Um, all right, couple of news and notes to get into really quickly. We're still waiting on the SEC schedule. This is as of Wednesday at 4:30. We're waiting on the SEC schedule. It's very very frustrating. It's annoying as hell because I'm ready. I'm ready for the schedule. But here's the good news. The schedule should be out by end of day today, which means I'm going to spend the entire next week giving my official, official predictions for the 2020 football season. So if you guys see the schedule come out, just know you have that to look forward to. I'm very excited about it. Also, one last thing as far as news and notes are concerned, fall camp starting August 17th. Um, August 17th, the official camp start date. They can start doing uh, meetings and walkthroughs 
tomorrow, August the 7th, up until the 16th, so up until before this. So they can do everything but practice uh, from the 7th to the 16th. Also, fall camp going to look different. Obviously, we all know that. But I thought it was really interesting. They're only going to be in full pads one day per week, and they have to give the players two days off per week. So I think it's an interesting model, and I think it's, you know, we might see it help out as far as injuries are concerned and guys not getting hurt. So I'll be excited about that um, as far as just maybe we'll be able to stay healthy going into the season. Um, All right, so I know that I have not done listener voicemails in a while, and I apologize for that. I went to the app that I run them through, and the app needed to be updated. So I hadn't been getting the notification. So we actually have two or three voicemails to get through. So I'm going to jump into those, and then we'll get into your listener questions, and then we'll get into the Savelle Newton interview. So let's go ahead and get into your listener questions here. Hi, this is Taylor. Um, my question for you guys is, is if Colin Hill – has any chance of starting. And I mean, I feel like if Holinsky struggles in one or two games, I think they're going to throw out Colin Hill. But the biggest question I have is, does Muschamp have the guts to change quarterbacks? Because we saw all last year, Holinsky was hurt, and he never changed. So will he have the ability to yank quarterbacks, considering his job is on the line? Thanks. Bye-bye. Taylor, appreciate the voicemail, and I hope you're listening because that voicemail was left July the 7th. Um, so, like I said, I apologize. The, vo- the, the notifications were not coming through. But, Taylor, thank you for the voicemail. Listen, it's a great question. And I think, honestly, because, listen, we have seen Muschamp be stubborn with quarterback. We just simply have. I mean, he, he, was, he was loyal to Jake Bentley to a fault. Loyal to Jake Bentley to a fault. Did not matter what he did. Jake Bentley was not coming out that game unless he was hurt. Um, but I'll tell you this. I, I do think, to your point, I think because of the situation this year and I think what's on the line for Will Mush. And listen, like I said, it doesn't matter if you think there's 0% chance he gets fired because of the pandemic. The point still stands. They need to have a good year. Like, they need to have a solid year going into 2021. Because if you have a bad year, you're only making it tougher on yourself to recruit and to keep this fan base on your side. So, you know, they need to have a good year. So, I just don't think I, – I, I could be wrong, but I think even now, especially with the rumblings we're hearing about Colin Hill, I, I think the best guy is going to play. I, I just think there's no time to play favorites. There's no time to be loyal to a fault to guys. The, he's going to play the guy that, that's going to win him games. He, he has to. He has no choice, and I think he knows that. So to answer your question, I think he will be willing to change quarterbacks. And listen, listen, if Colin Hill starts here and he sucks, you best believe he's going to throw Holinsky back in there. No question. No question. So um, I think no doubt. I think no doubt that uh, he'll be willing to change quarterbacks. All right, let's go to our next voicemail. Hey, uh, big-time Carolina fan here. Uh, I get kind of tired of the negativity online. Any chance you saw that the uh, top four rated NFL players were all three stars coming out of – three stars or below, sorry, coming out of high school? Uh, just wanted to point that out based on your most recent tweet. Uh, thanks. Uh, of course. Thank you for the voicemail. And of course we'd have a, a voicemail like that. No, listen, I, yeah, I mean, three-star players can come in, turn out to be NFL guys. Two-star players can come in. Hell, you got guys that go to D2 schools and, D, you know, FCS schools, and they turn out to be NFL guys. This is the last thing I'm going to say on it, so do not ask me again. To win the SEC championship, I, I, I welcome you to go look at the recruiting classes of those teams. Look at the recruiting classes of those teams that have won the SEC title and the national title and get back to me on what your observations are. That's all I'm going to say about it. There are a lot of good three-star guys in the NFL. There's no question. I'd also challenge you to look at the four-star and five-star guys that are in the NFL. I think your results and what you will find will be very, very interesting. That's all I'm going to say. on. All right, let's get to our last voicemail here. My buddy Tim calling in. Hey, Chris. It's been a while since that call left a message. I was going to call in on the radio show. I'll probably try to do that later in the week, but wanted to get this voicemail in on the pod for one show. There's a comment you made last week on the pod about Will Muschamp. I felt like I had to get my thoughts out there. You and I talked a little bit on Twitter about it. And, look, 
I, I echo what you say. Muschamp's a great guy. I really like Muschamp. He's a likable guy. He's a tireless worker, especially on the recruiting trail. His kids graduate. They don't get in any trouble. You don't see anybody getting arrested. But the man gets paid a lot of money to win football games. And I see people parade around and make up the excuses about the schedule, and I want to hit on that. Look, the schedule is always hard. It's always going to be hard. That is the product of playing in the SEC. I think people make a bigger deal about the schedule now versus when Spurrier was here because Clemson is what they are now. Yes, it is It is unbearable. The last few years have been insufferable as a Gamecock fan. I get it. The schedule is, is hard. It is brought up because of Clemson, and, and that's what I really think. People forget that in Spurrier's first four years, Florida won two national titles, one in an 06 and 08. They also went undefeated in 09, well, undefeated in the regular season in 09, played Alabama in a one-versus-two matchup and undefeated teams in the SEC title game. By the way, we also played Bama that year. People forget we played LSU the year they won the national title in 07. We played Auburn twice the year they won in 2010. Yes, we dropped Arkansas for A&M, but does anybody remember Darren McFadden and the chaos he caused or when Bobby Petrino was here? Well, at Arkansas and Ellis Johnson, we never, we never could stop. Ellis Johnson had nightmares against Bobby Petrino. <laughs> My point is the schedule is always hard. Does Muschamp just get an ultimate 10 to 15 year pass because, oh, well, we wait till the schedule maybe isn't as hard. So he needs 20 years, you know, to be because of the schedule. No, it doesn't work like that. It just, and also the other thing I brought up to you on Twitter, which we made a joke about, you can't complain about the schedule when you lose to North Carolina and App State. Your schedule, your argument about the schedule is invalid. It is unacceptable. So I want to drop that on there, but good stuff, man. I hopefully talk to you soon on the radio show. Take care. All right, Tim. Appreciate you, Tim. Yeah, awesome. Always great combo when I talk to Tim. And he actually threw up, we actually threw up an article uh, today, Wednesday, on uh, that Tim wrote. And a lot of the, the points he just made there in that voicemail, he echoed in that article. So I definitely suggest you take a look at that. But no, listen, there's a lot to unpack there, but I agree with you 110% of me. I said it on social media because I think people – and listen, this is most rational people don't get this. They understand. They don't get it twisted. I have no personal vendetta against Will Muschamp. Like, I don't dislike him as a human being. I think he's a fun guy. I think he's an awesome guy. I've hung out with him at a golf course. I know he's a cool dude. Like, I know he's a very cool guy. Um, very likable dude, which I think that's what people struggle with the most is to hear criticism of their head coach when he's such a likable guy. Um, that's one thing. But – no, listen, I made the point on social media before. It's nothing personal. But like you said, like Tim said, when you make the type of money these dudes make, you're open to criticism. You are. You're making so much money. And he brought up something, you know, I, that I really think needs to be stressed more. Listen, I hate Clemson. And I think playing in the ACC has certainly helped them. But one of the biggest things, the things I get most tired of hearing all the time is Carolina fans just bitch and moan constantly about how, oh, well, Clemson just doesn't have to play anybody and their schedule sucks. Like, listen, I'm not saying their schedule's very good. I'm not saying it doesn't help them. But it's kind of like Tim just said. When you're losing to UNC and App State and you lost to Virginia – Bro, when's the last time we beat an ACC team? So, I mean, the schedule argument just loses a lot of its luster when you're losing those type of games. But, you know, again, 100% agree with Tim. The schedule is always going to be hard. It's always going to be hard. If this team's not good at this point, well, guess what? Another team's going to be good. Bottom line. Another team, I mean, yes, we had a shitty draw for trading in A&M for Arkansas. But like he said, Arkansas was – Kicking our ass when Spurrier took the job. So, yeah. I mean, listen, I, Tim, I think that was a great call, great voicemail. He wrote a great article, which we posted. There's a lot of great points in there. Like I said, the main thing is this. I do not dislike Will Muschamp as a person. I think he runs a fantastic program Sunday through Friday. But you get paid to win on Saturdays. You get paid to win on Saturdays. That's the bottom line. 
That's the bottom line. You get paid to win on Saturdays. And if you can't do that, find somebody else who can. That is the bottom line, point blank. It's no gray area. It's white and black. So hopefully, Will Muschamp will do that um, starting this fall. Hopefully that comes through and that's the case. So appreciate the voicemails, guys. Really, again, really, really do appreciate the voicemails. Um, we do have a listener question from Twitter. If I can get to it. Yeah, it's Terrence Harris Ask which linebacker will have the most interceptions? Very good question there. I'm going to go, you know, Ernest Jones is the easy answer. I mean, you have to go Ernest, right? You have to go Ernest Jones. I, he's just the overall best linebacker. I'm, I'm going to put, if I got to put my money anywhere, um, I'm going to put it on Ernest Jones, simply put. I mean, he, he is that dude on defense. He is that playmaker on defense that's going to make things happen for you. So, again, if I'm putting my money anywhere, I'm putting it on Ernest Jones to have the most interceptions. Um, so, we'll see how it pans out. But, certainly, I think there are other guys that can get in there, too. I think Sherrod Green could challenge for it. But, we'll see. Um, all right, let's get to your listener questions on Instagram. Krusty Andy asks, which is a phenomenal username, by the way. By the way, Krusty Andy asks, who's our fastest linebacker? How fast could they run group therapy to Williams Bryce? Um, our fastest linebacker? <sighs> probably hmm I mean dude I'd have to look at their 40s I genuinely don't know I feel like Jamar Brown and Mo Cabo are pretty, especially Jamar Brown 61205 he's one of the lighter guys I think he's probably pretty fast and from group therapy to Williams Bryce shit man I mean I, I got no idea I mean it just depends on what they drank and what shots they had man they might not be able to run at all might not be able to get out of their chair after a, after a night at group therapy so <laughs> um, cut up gentleman ass. I think Jordan Burtz plays a lot as linebacker hybrid rather than a down DN. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, Justin, appreciate the question. No, I, I agree, man. I, listen, I, I I bunched up Jordan Burtz with the DNs because it was easy because I you obviously see I don't have a buck position here on the position unit previews, but I could definitely see I think he's going to be that type of guy. He's going to play that DJ Wanham type of role. You're going to see him with his hand in the dirt sometimes. You're going to see him standing up sometimes and causing havoc and just kind of floating around the defense and being that pass rusher off the edge. So I agree with you 110%. You know, you would think with Will Muschamp and T-Rob and those guys being defensive-minded dudes, they're going to find a way to put Jordan Birch in the best possible positions to wreak havoc because we know he's capable. We absolutely know that he's capable. He's capable of being a big-time player for this defense over his career. So, yeah, I think you'll certainly see him do both. There's no question in my mind that you will see him do both for sure. Um, Emery Moore, Jr. More likely, Ryan is benched at some point this year or Muschamp is fired before 2021. Definitely Ryan benched at some point. Hell, he might not even start this season. So, yeah, it's 110% Ryan benched at some point. I think with the pandemic, listen, I'm I'm preparing myself for Muschamp to come back. I think they literally have to go two and eight or worse. I really do. So, I think uh, much more likely that Ryan gets benched, no doubt. So, uh, last question here, Evan B underscore 100. What's the key for the Gamecocks linebackers to make it a no fly zone? I mean, it all comes down to just assignment football. I mean, like I said earlier, be more consistent. I mean, just just simply put, assignment football. I think South Carolina has recruited well enough at the position to be effective in the passing game. I, you know, I think I think they have. We'll see. But uh, you know, I, I think it's just and also getting help from the rest of the defense. Though, I mean, listen, it all starts up front with the defensive line. If we can get the defensive line to play up to their capabilities and wreak havoc on quarterbacks, the linebackers are going to look much better in pass coverage. You know what I mean? So it comes down to a lot of that as well. So I think, listen, you have the players, just be more consistent. Play assignment football. It's really all it comes down to. Um, all right, cool. Appreciate the listener questions, guys. Have a fantastic interview. He's a friend of the show. He's been on before. Former Gamecocks football player, really do it all. Swiss Army knife for South Carolina football. Savell Newton, a good buddy of mine. Really excited for you guys to hear this conversation. Sit back, relax, enjoy. It's all brought to you by our friends again at SeatGeek. SeatGeek, the best ticket buying app by far, the only ticket buying app I use, and the only one that I recommend. Go download the SeatGeek app or go to SeatGeek.com. Use the promo code SPURSUP. You're going to save $20 off your first purchase. Guys, like I said earlier, sports are on their way back. We're going to have fans in the seat soon. You want to make sure you're getting your tickets through the best ticket buying app possible. What they're going to do for you, they got a great ticket rating system, right? So you're going to know exactly 
where you're sitting, how much you're paying. Are you getting a good deal? Are you getting ripped off? You're not going to have to scalp any tickets because, listen, scalping is going to become a thing of the past anyways. So you want to make sure you're going through the best possible app that's going to save you the most money. It's going to give you the best bang for your buck. Zero questions asked. They are changing the game when it comes to ticket buying. So, again, that's our friends at SeatGeek. Go download the SeatGeek app or go to SeatGeek.com. Use the promo code SPURSUP, that's S-P-R-S-U-P, to save $20 off your first purchase. Enjoy this conversation with former Gamecock football player, Savelle Newton. All right, joining us today on the Spurs Up show, friend of the show, former Gamecocks football player, Savelle Newton. We had him back on the show way back in 2018, if you were listening then. But just to give you a little bit of his credentials, you guys already know, was at South Carolina from 2003 to 2006 during his career. He passed for 2,474 yards. He ran for 786 yards, and he received for 673 yards. He even played defense for a little bit. 16 total tackles, or excuse me, 20 total tackles. He had one tackle for loss and one sack that helped South Carolina secure a win over Clemson in 2006. He's one of just four college football players of all time to be in the 600 club, which means he finished with over 600 yards passing, rushing, and receiving. Truly the Swiss Army knife of Gamecock football and someone that I'm very blessed to call a friend of mine, former Gamecock football player, Savelle Newton. Savelle, appreciate you taking the time, my friend. It's a pleasure to have you on once again. Yeah, man, you know, uh, great. Thanks, man, for having me on again. Um, anytime I uh, get get asked to do things, I like to honor it. Um, and, you know, this we have, like you said, it seemed like it's been such a long time, and it actually <laughs> has been such mm. a long time since you hit me up and sent me the nice um, sweatshirt doing this, you know. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, man, thanks for having me back on. Yeah, absolutely. So, Savelle, let's go back to the beginning for you because you, you can't talk about your career with just talking about how you got there. Obviously, you were a standout in high school. It was Marlboro County. Um, you really tore it up in high school, one of the top-rated recruits in the country. And um, we've got to talk about your recruitment, the official announcement itself, because it came down to South mm-hmm. Carolina and Clemson, and we all know um, – the dramatics of recruiting you know we see it all the time with guys which schools they pick and we see them in these all-star games like a lot of them that commit to Georgia they pull off the bulldog or a lot of them they do different things or you went with the hat throw which if people haven't seen the video you put on the Clemson hat you throw it off you put on the Carolina hat just talk about that day picking between Carolina and Clemson and I guess what made you want to do that I guess yeah, it's funny that you uh, brought that up. I was just um, talking to a couple of guys the other day that I uh, played against in high school, and we were talking about the whole recruiting um, thing, and they were saying, man, like, they, they didn't remember anybody doing anything like throwing a hat or throwing a hat or switching the hats until I had did it um, back a long time ago. And I was like, I, I doubt I was the first person to do it, but you know, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it was one of the things that we had the hats lined up, and I actually did do that, um, take the hat off. And um, I actually didn't mean to throw it on the ground. <laughs> but what had <laughs> happened was it, it slid. The table was kind of slick, 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 slid off the table. But, you know, um, you know, after that, that's just, it is what it was. But that was a, it was a long recruiting process, uh, being a number, four, number five quarterback coming out um, in that class. I had so many offers that that man, I I, I might have committed, decommitted, committed, committed, decommitted, like maybe like six times. Did did it ever occur to you to go out of state, or was it always like you wanted to stay in state? Uh, South Carolina, South Carolina, and Clemson were not even on my radar. Like really, like it, I didn't, I never wanted to go to South Carolina. Uh, you know, I never wanted to go to Clemson. Either one of them, I actually didn't even like pay them any attention like that so um um I, my first school I committed to was Auburn so mm. um I wanted to leave uh growing up in Marlboro County if you know about Marlboro County it's such mm. a you know such a country environment and it's everybody's home so you never get an opportunity to experience leaving um I never knew anything so the opportunities was coming all the way from Hawaii <laughs> so mm. you know just to know about some of those things. And um, it went from Auburn to, you know, interest in LSU to all the way to the California schools to where I was set on going to UCLA. And I remember you telling me about when it came down to Carolina and Clemson that you were, I mean, I remember from our conversation last time, you were very close to going to Clemson and then switched to Carolina. What, what went into, I guess, I mean, just what made the final decision? I know obviously Lou Holtz is at USC at the time and, 
obviously which position you're going to play on the field probably had a lot to do with it. But what all went yeah. into that decision? Uh, cra- crazily, man, Vanderbilt was right there also. Um, uh, Coach Johnson, Coach Johnson, Coach, coached my brother at Furman, so he um, he was there. They were very close to actually pulling me in um, late late in that recruiting process. Um, I, the, the thing that happened with me as far as ending up at South Carolina, it was just um, getting the opportunity to talk to Demetri Summers, who was the number one player coming out that year, and Noah Whiteside, and just um, coming on the recruiting visit. It was totally different from Clemson. I mean, the environment was totally uh, different. They, the Clemson don't have that environment, which I would say now, but um, mm. just the opportunity. I felt like I had a better opportunity uh, going against uh, Dondra uh, Pinkins at the time for the starting quarterback position, um, other than trying to compete against uh, Clipboard Jesus. Uh, <laughs> you know, so I, I, I just felt that it was the right place being able to play for Coach Holtz. Uh, when he came to visit me on my in home, it was uh, it was such a great in home visit. My mom, my mom loved it, and that was just an opportunity for me to, to end up there. Yeah, it, it's not every day you get to play for a Hall of Famer like Lou Holtz. Just expand a little bit on the relationship with him, because what I think was interesting, you know, I think a lot of us assume Skip Holtz would take the head coaching job, and you saw. As Lou was there, you know, I think his offense evolved, and Skip really brought out the the spread offense. I mean, you saw kind of Phil Petty running that, and I thought you, oh, yeah. think you saw a little bit of it with Corey Jenkins and then Dondrell Pinkins. But just just talk about overall the relationship with the the Holtz family. Well, uh, you know, when I actually Skip Holtz was uh, he played a major factor in my adjustment to the high school game because um, you know growing up a lot of things like I said we it was not we're not. Uh, actually fortunate to be able to go to camps or anything like that but um my my church um uh, had had seen seen the thing i wanted to go to this carolina camp and things like that so when i went to the carolina camp i learned so much in those few days with coach skip to where i grew a relationship to where we went 15 and 0 that next the upcoming season just all based on changing my the way i throw the ball and you know so um that was a big part of it i knew I knew we were going to be going to the spread offense. Um, they had just transitioned to it, actually ran Clemson offense in, in high school uh, following Woodrow Dantzler. But to, um, you know, just like I said, seeing that Carolina had converted uh, into the spread offense, no one knew that, you know, that we would be going back into single back, running a lot of single back and going back into a, a fullback set. Once I once I arrived on campus, which that was a, a, I think a bit confusion between Coach Skip and 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 Coach Lou. For sure. So we, I know we talked about it a lot on the last time we talked. You can dive as deep into it or as little as you want, but obviously you were there during the coaching change between <clears throat> Lou Holtz to Steve Spurrier and just how it all went down. It was sort of all sudden and everything. And we know how Steve Spurrier's career at South kind of went down. But I remember you last time telling me that. You know, listen, it's people don't understand that it's not always a smooth transition for everybody on the roster. You, you go from yep. oh, yeah. a guy that didn't recruit you to it's a completely different mindset and philosophy and the culture completely changes and stuff like that. And, you know, you were able to find yourself have some success while Steve Spurrier was there, definitely, especially at the quarterback position in 2006. But mm-hmm. um, if you want to expand on it, you can. If not, it's fine. But I, I just, you know, I think people, it's interesting to hear your side as just how – you know how tough the transition was for some guys, you know, including yourself. Well, it was it was, it was very tough for me. Um, you know, for those who who pretty much know what I went through during that time. Um, mm-hmm. You know, coming off um, finishing that season, being being the um, being the quarterback. Yeah. In the end, in the season, starting quarterback, um, taking over for Don Drell, beating beating uh, you know teams like Alabama, Arkansas that year. Um, you know, as a freshman and um, I mean, as a, well, a sophomore, but my first year and it, it was it was kind of tough, you know, to not even get an opportunity to compete for the starting job when Coach Holtz arrived, when Coach Spurry arrived on campus, um, you know, I, I, when he arrived on campus, it was uh, it, it was immediately you a wide receiver. So mm-hmm. there was no quarterback battle. Uh, mm-hmm. Blake was crowned was crowned the, the starting position, which I had no idea why. But um, 
you know, it, it was just, it was tough. It was tough to understand. And, you know, I was given the opportunity to transfer. But during that time, you know, transferring wasn't, uh, it wasn't a big thing. No one actually right. really knew much about it. There was no transfer portal. So, you know, I, of course, someone like myself, who, who've been a starter for two years, in the, the, you know, to get the opportunity to transfer, you know, it's kind of scary because you know you're going to lose that year uh, or have to go somewhere and sit out. So that was not an option for me. And, you know, so I stayed and and, and pretty much just just kind of – that's when, when it kind of – well, I mean, when, as soon as I arrived on campus, it was already, you know, mm-hmm. you, you know, do whatever I have to do to take – to help the team. So – um, being unselfish, you know, being unselfish during that transition might have, you know, put me in a place where, you know, going, seeing these guys uh, like Chris Leak and all these teams lead, 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 lead their teams to championships or, or titles during that time where a running quarterback was mm-hmm. not really, you know, there and the things that I was doing during that time, like beating Alabama with the two the two touchdowns late in the game. And, you know, it, just, it, it wasn't there. So to know not under, I was definitely not caught off guard by – I was caught off guard by being not being able to compete for the starting job at all. Right. You know, I was going to say, you kind of mentioned it. You sort of touched on it. But just putting a positive spin in almost, I would argue that because of that, 05 and 06 is really where – your legend came from, and, and you saw it a little bit in 2004 as well because, I mean, you, you ran the ball a pretty, pretty decent amount in 2004 as well. But I think 05 and 06 is really where you saw your value come out as far as, like I said in the beginning of the show, that Swiss Army knife type of player. I mean, and you got hurt that year, I might add. So you were on pace for even more, but 21 carries, 150 yards. You were averaging seven yards a carry, had two touchdowns, and then 27 catches for 297. You had a touchdown that opening game against UCF. Um, averaging 11 yards per catch. I mean, you really, you really put yourself on the map. I think in 05, and again, especially 06, as that true versatile playmaker, like you were saying. I mean, I, I think the proofs in the pudding, the numbers speak out to that. Um, and then you run into the injury in 2005, which I think a lot of people forget about uh, the Vanderbilt game. I, I the, the highlight sticks out vividly in my head. You know, you run out the middle, explosive run, go down. Uh, you score that. What it was on the touchdown, right? It was on the touchdown run. Um, yeah, was, and your teammates was, was are going to pick you up. Yeah. And anytime you see that happen where your teammates are trying to celebrate and the guys on the ground, you're like, okay, something, something's wrong. So just talk about, you know, I know that was something, again, you, you've talked about, and we're going to get into a little bit later in the show about some of the things you battled just from the mental side of sports and the mental side of things. But I mean, just talk about taking on that challenge. I mean, not even just physically, but mentally, because you're on, I feel like as an athlete, you're on such a path, you know what I mean? Like I'm going to do this, I'm going to get drafted, I'm going to go here, whatever. Mm-hmm. And something like that comes and it just completely throws everything into a tailspin. Yeah, man. You know, um, most people, most people probably don't know and probably don't agree with the, you know, some of the stats, but it was kind of funny in, in that 2005 year where we were getting ready to play against Kentucky Wildcats. And, you know, a lot of my teammates and, you know, coaches kid could, um, you know, verify receipts of it. <laughs> you know, we were getting ready to play Kentucky Wildcats and I was starting that wide receiver and, you know, Blake was kind of, he was kind of struggling a little bit. And Coach Spurrier had said, you know, hey, Savelle, you know, come come throw the ball a couple times. And I was mm. like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of that what it is. And then the next day of practice, you know, like we got our, our pamphlets or whatever for the week. Uh, and we had a formation in there that was called Wildcat Formation because we was going against um, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And um, the the formation simply is what it is now, you know, or what it had had become, to where I would line up at wide receiver, motion in the quarterback, late motion out, or, or however it was. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that was actually, I would say, and I, I mean, I don't get the credit for it, but um, you know, I should. But probably <laughs> the first, <laughs> I mean, being honest, the first person to you know kind of run the actual wildcat. Mm-hmm. Um, offense was against the Kentucky Wildcats. That's where it kind of um, evolved from. And then you got um, the Vanderbilt game where we were where we were very you know uh, efficient in doing that. Um, where I threw two touchdown passes from from a wide, one from a wide receiver position on a trick play, and then um, like you said, the injury mm-hmm. play from twelve yards out. 
So that kind of changed my, you know, kind of changed my trajectory because I definitely was not coming back my senior year. Um, but uh, to have that injury, you know, it was kind of, kind of eye opening. You know, I didn't know what was going on. They told me I, I was done because the injury, you know, rupturing your Achilles. Yeah. Normally, a lot of times <laughs> it takes you out. So, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't know nothing about rupturing an Achilles. But once I did it, it was, you know, a fight, fight to get back for my senior season. So one of my favorite games that I just thought of, Savelle, I want to talk about, because that 2006 season, and you played a lot of quarterback. Um, you threw 12 uh-huh. touchdowns. You threw five in one game to Sidney Rice. I, I mean, yeah. I can't even imagine how much fun it was throwing him the football. Because, I mean, anybody that can go out there, and I don't care who you're playing, you can catch five touchdowns in a game. You are – I mean, those are like Madden numbers for anybody. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That game was it was it was fun, man. Um, just to be able to um, get there and you playing against Florida Atlantic, you know, it's kind of that game where we ain't had no um, no touch no passing touchdowns. Yeah, and they're against those guys and saying, okay, you know, let's do this. And me and Sydney was clicking very well. Now, I, however. Even though those five touchdowns did happen, I was very pissed that um, you know that Coach Spurrier took me out um, not to get that sixth one because it was in, it was a third it was the third quarter and you know everyone knew you know getting that record was right. There. You, you think so, of all people, Spurrier is going to want to throw the sixth one and the seventh one yeah, and the eighth. It's like, know, come on, Coach. You know I mean? But you know, I, it seemed like every time I got right there <laughs> close to get to achieving something as like the 600 club or, you know, to get those eight yards that ESPN was even talking about during the bowl mm-hmm. game, my, uh, the Liberty Bowl, like, you know, how would it feel to, you know, pass to pass Heinz Ward or whatever like that on that on that list. But, you know, he didn't even, you know, didn't even get to get on offense like I was promised. But, you know, it is it is what it is, you know, that's in the past. Yeah, I think one of my favorite passes from that Florida Atlantic game, I think maybe you roll out or something, but you throw a deep ball, just throw it up for grabs, and Sydney comes down with it, and you just look over, and you're just like – you're like yeah. almost mad at yourself, but it's a touchdown. So you're like, well, oh, well, screw it. I guess, I guess well, we'll take it. One, it, was, it was one of those days. <laughs> <laughs> just, one, just one of those days where they're all falling. Yeah, so, yeah, I was I was gonna say. I mean, either way, Savelle, how it went. I mean, the the fact is, you are a part of two South Carolina teams that, you know, accomplished a lot of firsts at Carolina. I, mean, I think of your first season, oh five, and again, I know you got hurt kind of halfway through, but you know, beating Tennessee, beating Florida, um, you know, achieving things that had not been achieved at South Carolina in a long, long the first ever win in Knoxville. And in 06, you know, obviously, again, you win the Liberty Bowl, you beat Clemson at Clemson. I mean, I guess how, how special were those times? Do you Like, looking back now, I mean, just thinking of those teams that you were on, some of the accomplishments you guys had. Again, you know, there, there are a lot of teams that since you guys have done different things, you know, we went, won 11 games in a row or won 11 games three years in a row and done this and that. But for a couple of things, you're, you guys, the teams you were on were the first to do it. You were the yeah. first to do it. Uh, just, just talk about, like, reflecting on it now, how special is that to you? Man, those, those teams that um, – especially that, 0, that 05, 06, 06, 07 years, man, we actually had the talent to win the SEC. Um, we, we were a few games away, like, my, even, like, my senior year, like, um, you know, the, the drop pass, the drop pass against Auburn. Um, you know, dead down the middle, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, Tennessee, fourth and, you know, fourth and, fourth and eight, we come back, we beating those guys and we had them. And then, you know, the pass down the sideline against Carlos Thomas, um, you know, that, that year, Florida, you know, Florida, mm-hmm. my, I dropped the interception that could have ended the game. I was, I was at safety and I mean, by God, the ball hit me dead in my hands. <laughs> and then you know, and we had him for like fourth and two down, and Tebow jumps over my head because I I was not going to hit him again. Mm. But um, you know that that was a game. Then three block field goals. We beat Florida. You know we win those games. It's small things that we that we win those games. We're we're right there at the ten eleven games, just like you know the other teams that came about. And then no Demetrius Summers. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, seriously. No, yeah. I, I think it's uh. You know, obviously, uh, you know, Jared Cook's had a fantastic career in the NFL. Oh, yeah. and I, I think right. it's a little unfair. He's only – I feel like he's only remembered at South Carolina for that drop pass. I, like, that's the no. first thing that comes to everybody's mind is that drop pass. 
well, you know, they can remember it for, for him. Uh, for me, yes, but um, for 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 others, I mean, he he had a great career, a great career at Carolina, man. Um, you know, watching his transition. Um, I know we're not talking about him, but watching right, his right. transition. Um, that close, that close to leaving Carolina. I mean, he struggled. He struggled so much getting used to um, what Coach Steve Spurrier Jr. was doing with um, the wide receivers, not fitting that mold, being 6'5", not, you know, not as fast at the time, but um, but super athletic. And I'm, I'm so happy that he found a home and was able to transition and not, you know, not be selfish, transition into that, that tight end position to where he found a home and, and, and look at him. I mean, making all yeah. the um, yeah. elbows and things. Great for him. Yeah, Jared's a physical freak, man. He is he is a specimen, that is for sure. So I, I want to jump to Savelle again, like I mentioned, over your career, um, 18 total tackles, a tackle, for, or a tackle for loss and a sack. And like I said, the sack came in the Clemson game. But just you playing uh, defense, like I think a lot of people probably forget that you played defense. Just, just yep. I remember we talked about it a little bit last time, but again, just, just talk about how that came about because it seems so strange to take one of, if not your best <laughs> offensive playmaker and put him at safety. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that story, you know, that story has – I've heard that story so many times on the head and, 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 you know, right now I'm so I'm so in a different space in life. Right. The way I talk about it now, the way I would talk, probably talked about it the last time we was on this podcast, um, you know, it, it, it was – it was definitely something that I did never wanted to do and never thought I would have had to do. Um, but you know, I was, I was forced into that, man. It was, it was kind of like, I woke up, I woke up to a phone call and said, Hey, you gotta be at the defensive meeting. And you know, I was like, okay, well maybe they wanted me to, <laughs> to, to, to point some things out what they were doing on the offense. So um, Florida was doing on the offensive side. I never thought, no, then coach Ron Cooper, um, who made the actual phone call to me? Um, I'm pretty sure he can uh, verify this. Um, basically, said, "No, son. You, you know, we, uh, coach, coach made a decision to move you, move you to defense. Mm-hmm. You know, you go from being the starting quarterback against Auburn, getting, um, you know, all eight blitz at you the whole time, and running play action passes. Then Blake gets in, and uh, you know, then finally goes a three step drop while I'm crying on the sideline. Like, let me throw some three step drops." But um, that was that was pretty much that was pretty much how how that went, and um, you know, and I asked, I asked, you know, I asked coach, coach, uh, I was like, hey man, what's going on? I, I I can't move back to wide receiver or running back or anything at that time, and it was I was specifically told, no, we don't have a place for you on offense. So I was like, wow, you know. So that whole week, I just. Made made my mind up. I was going to disrupt practice by jamming every receiver that we had on the line, and, <laughs> and I didn't care if it was Sydney. I didn't care who it was. Like right? that was probably, if you ask anybody who was on that team, that was probably one of the most intense practice weeks that we had, which almost put us in line to beat uh, beat Florida that week. Yeah, and like I said, I mean, you people forget you made one of the biggest plays. Of the season, I mean, that was Spurrier's first win over Clemson. I mean, the sack on what was it? Was it uh, Will Parker? I think was in the game, and for whatever uh-huh. reason, was was that who it was at quarterback for Clemson? Oh, I think it- Will Parker. It was um, he was wor- way worse than Will Parker. <laughs> <laughs> who was it? I, why did my why is this name slipping my mind? Uh, gosh, is it uh, Colin Harper? Maybe I I can't remember. I no, honestly, way worse than Colin Harper. <laughs> I can't believe I don't remember. Either way, you get the sack though, and what. And um, all I knew, he was he had pretty eyes. <laughs> yeah, number fourteen, yeah. Proctor. Was it Proctor. Proctor. It was Proctor. They, I think, yeah. I got my wills mixed up. It was, I think, it was Will Proctor. Yeah, Will. yeah, yeah. yeah Why guy. Clemson didn't run the ball, I don't know. But I mean, you you make the sack that set up. You know, one of the most memorable parts of the rivalry was Jad Dean hooking the ball, hooking the Will. ball, and Gamecocks getting the W. So, <laughs> I mean. Yeah. Yeah, so, how, let me. I'll ask you how. I mean, just how did it feel to beat Clemson? I mean, you finally beat them. That was, you know, you go out as a senior beating them at their place. You know, Death yeah. Valley is silent. We all remember the call by Todd Ellis. That that has to be, that has to be a pretty cool feeling for that to be like your your last regular season game going out yeah. on top over your rivals. Like, you know, this is this is awesome. Well, to get that win, man. I mean, 
um, it was it was it was everything. Uh, that week, man, we we studied film so much, and um, being an offensive being an offensive player in a defensive meeting room is 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 everything because I pointed out they had their their a left tackle, a left tackle. Um, they had a left tackle during that time that pretty much he he the way he lined up every play told whether they were running the ball or passing. So me being at safety, I would I would scream up to Jasper be like, pass, run. We knew, we knew, we knew what was going on. So that um that that actual sack, that actual sack was based on like knowing like they were passing the ball. Right. Otherwise I wouldn't even blitz. Uh, so we knew that they were passing the ball on that play. So to be a part to be a part of that man, to be a part of the win and and that was actually also the game that that actually turned my my football career um around also by getting hurt that game well, that's the game I fractured my pelvic bone I didn't even know it until I got to the combine so um mm-hmm. that that was that was a great win and also you know <laughs> a great loss for me yeah for sure i i want to switch gears a little bit cuz like you said i mean again the the adversity that you battled Savell some of it's very well a lot of it's very well documented a lot of it's not uh, there was an article put out, Watch Fox did, a good buddy of mine, Mike Yuva, who we just had on the show last week. Uh, this story was published in May, just talking about, you. I've seen you go go live with Ryan Holinsky with his Holinsky's Hope stuff, talking about mental health and stuff like that. And again, you dealt with a ton of injuries and maybe your professional career didn't exactly go the way you planned for sure. Um, but just talk about, I guess, how it's made you better as a person. Because like you said, even since the last time we've talked, and I can definitely tell your whole mentality and mindset and view on things has changed, and I think for the better. But just, just talk about you know again a lot of what's highlighted in this article where you were. You know, it talks about the death of Kenny McKinley, which you all remember, and that was a really good friend of yours and a teammate. And again, just changing the entire mindset. I mean, you became the owner of BU for You Love Yourself LLC, um, which is a business that does a, does what counseling, um, counseling for kids and stuff like that. So just. Just overall, I know it's a lot to unpack, but just just talk yeah. about that, the changes in your life and overall your mental health and how, how everything's just changed for the better for you. Well, I mean, with me, it was more just finding myself, man, um, outside right. of sports, finding myself outside of, of, of feeling like a um, maybe a failure at, at being at something that I knew I was actually good at. Um, you know, I, you know, anytime you chasing something, you chasing what I would call what you think is your purpose. Mm-hmm. And once you don't fulfill that 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 purpose that you think is your is your purpose, it it it, it causes it causes mental issues. It, and it don't have to be football. It don't have to be sports. It could be anything. You know, uh, it could be someone trying fighting to be a doctor or be a lawyer or anything. If they don't become that and they just knew that's what in their heart, like that's what they're supposed to be, they gonna have struggles. And um, that's where I was, and you know, still kind of you know, torn about how some of the things had went on at South, South Carolina. That's why I've always had like a kind of chip on my shoulder when it always came to discussing Carolina and, and talking about would I go back and do this and, and my love for the school and everything. So it's been like a love and hate relationship. Mm-hmm. But uh, now, you know, just to be in a different a different place after, you know, battling anxiety and depression and and being at a position where, um, you know, at, like I said, even at one point where I was sleeping in my car, you know, so at, to be at that position to to look back and say, you know, like, man, like, what are you doing? And to be in counseling, uh, going to counseling uh, twice a week. Um, and, and it was it was tough. You know, it was tough. And, and I, I, I fought, I fought, I fought until I figured out that just what I what what the business that says right now be you for you love yourself that that's basically um you know what I, I pretty much go out and talk about right now and, and I had to practice that and it, it was it was a total life change for me I went back and rewrote some of those things I changed the narrative on you know my beef with Coach Spurry I changed the narrative on my beef with Carolina I changed the narrative on you know feeling like a you know, I failed, I failed my family or anything like that, or I failed myself. So all the narratives have been changed and rewritten and I'm still rewriting my story every day, man. And, and just to be in this position now, this is what I think 
a lot of universities are missing. They're missing those who have fought true adversity to be around these guys, to have them ready for adversity, you know, because there's going to be a lot of hurt people that's not going to really, you know, be able to express them, show themselves, like show, make themselves known to get an NFL shot due to what, you know, what we're going through right now. So, you know, some of those those guys are going to fight, you know, mentally and emotionally because they, they're going to feel cheated out of something. But if you got things in line in preparation for that already, which I think Marcus, I think Marcus did a great job uh, mm -hmm. while he was there. And I hope Connor um, also does a great job while he's there also because he fought some adversity. But just if you don't, if you're not prepared mentally, uh, man, like you, you were struggling in life, and and that's my whole key to everything I do, and I, that's why I love Ryan so much, man. Mm -hmm. He's he's a dope guy, man. I mean, no matter his struggles on the field uh, as a freshman, being through into the toughest, um, you know, schedule, which is still football. You still have to show up. I'm not gonna make an excuse for him, but um, you know, it, it is what 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 his he and his family went through, and being able to bring um, that that hope. And that everything that they're doing uh, to this community here in Gamecock and Gamecock football is 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 amazing, man. For sure, no, that's that's awesome, man. I, I can speak. I know I can say I'm I'm glad as your friend to hear all that. I mean, for sure, you got a lot of positive stuff going on. A lot of people in your life that love you too. So I mean, for sure, oh, yeah. um, we can't have you on the show, Savelle, without talking Gamecock football. You mentioned Ryan Helinski and. Will yeah. Muschamp, as we're speaking today, actually had a presser, I guess, preview in fall camp. And we know football is going to look a little different this fall. There's no question. Um, yeah. The SEC going to a 10-game conference-only schedule. No Carolina-Clemson game, which has got everybody fired up. And I, I okay. saw you tweet about the, the Carolina-Clemson stuff today. But, again, football season is just going to look different in general. Um, and, and this is a very interesting year. Listen, I mean, the last time you and I talked, South Carolina was coming off, what, an eight wins – or, excuse me, a – a seven-win season, that was 2018. So they were coming off a seven-win season. Pretty solid year overall. Um, we're going into a bowl game that we thought, thought was very winnable. But what I'm saying is that was a long time ago, it feels like, in regards to football. Uh, yeah. Now, you know, I, no matter what your feelings are, I'll say this, Savelle, no matter what your feelings are on Will Muschamp and the coaching staff, this is a big year for Carolina football, in my opinion. It's an important year. It's a year that – you want to show progress. You want to show, hey, the program is moving in the right direction. It's a year that you'd like to see South Carolina, you know, knock off a couple of teams. Maybe it hasn't, you know, maybe in that losing streak to Texas A&M or get another big upset win like you got last year with Georgia. But it's a big year either way. I don't care if it's conference only or whatever. What's your overall outlook going into this 2020 Gamecocks football season? What are you expecting from this team this year? And, and what will be a crazy year because of the pandemic and stuff like that? Well, I mean, first, first of all, let's let's talk pandemic. You know, is football is going to change the the environment? It's going to change from, you know, being uh, being in a conference where each and every each and every week you're going to a stadium that's packed with you know sixty sixty plus thousand fans and 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 playing in that environment, um, and to have. Um, a new offensive coordinator like Mike Bobo to to join our staff is 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 tremendous, which I think um, that's going to be a major change up for us. Um, mm. And I just think you know I have and and let me let me let me um, before we go into that let me let me go ahead into uh, what you I heard you said what my my beef is with the staff I don't have a beef with um the staff so let's go ahead and throw it no, I was just I was just saying just for I would say to any fan it's like no matter if you how you feel about I'm just saying it's an important year yeah yeah not yeah, yeah, not yeah. you specifically I'm just saying like no matter what my opinion is or somebody else like we can all yeah. admit like this is a pretty important and it's every year is important yeah. but like it's just as far as showing progress I think we can all admit like we we all want to see the same yeah, thing, yeah, of know? course, yeah, yeah, for sure. of course, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah, I just, I just know, you know, a lot of, a lot of people. I just wanted to, um, you know, clarify that. No, I for sure. No, I wasn't trying I to imply have, that. Yeah. No, I. Yeah, yeah, I don't. I got you. I, I got don't you. have an issue. I don't have an issue with the staff. I did have an issue with Bobby Bentley, which I would say publicly, publicly, mm. um, you know, but I don't even have an issue with him anymore. Um, so that, it, um, that is what it is. Uh, you know, yeah, I sound no, like it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> it's all but, good. Uh, yeah. It is what it is, but at the end of the day, um, I think I think returning our secondary is mm -hmm. going to be a, a, a major key factor in in who we're going to be um, as a team. Uh, when you get when you got guys like um, 
like like seven and two four on um, one and two four on the outside, and then you got mm-hmm. a guy like Cam Smith, probably the fastest guy on the team, um, sitting there uh, coming in to run some of your nickel packages. Uh, Jamie Jamie um, had a great freshman year uh, like no other. Um, he's going to be even more experienced this year. And um, who's going to fill, fill that last spot in the secondary? Maybe Shiloh, never know. Um, mm. But um, our secondary is going to be so strong, man. And, and to have young guys on that defensive line, um, um, you know, no clownies. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think collectively this would be probably – um, one of the one of the best probably defensive lines that we have going into this season um, that could probably stack up to where, as a full unit yeah. as to when those guys were in um, in in Columbia um, and they by by the time they're seniors they're definitely going to be that um, mm-hmm. but the offensive side of the ball I, I watched I watched Ryan I watched his training I watched his speed training which everyone is saying he's already quicker on his feet. Um, he knew what he had to do. That's why, like I said, one of the reasons you got a guy um, um, that transferred in from Colorado State who's already familiar with the offense. Um, you know, I wouldn't be opposed to seeing a two, you know, a two quarterback uh, system um, with, with anything to help us win. And, and mm-hmm. uh, Luke, you know, Luke, he's a t- tremendous um, guy. He's going to be in that bubble of mm-hmm. is if he's going to be a receiver or if he's going to be um, a quarterback which, you know, I think he could uh, actually do both in the running backs, man. We, 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 I feel like this is going to be a year that we got a stable of running backs. Kind of remind me, reminds me of that 2004, 2005 uh, year where we had Demetrius, Corey, Kenny Irons, Dacus Terman, guys the great. But we had five running backs that could bust you across the head at any mm. point of the game. <laughs> so we stacked. Um, we're stacked. Um, so uh, it is, I think it is up to the to the coaches at, at this point to where when you look at it, you look at the uh, depth chart and you look at what we got. Like you know, this is kind of like a show and prove year. Not not to me, but to um, just I think game cop nation to where um, you know everyone say give give everybody a chance, give everybody a chance. But in this in this arena, your chances are, you know, your first four to five years. Mm. And I think this year is kind of like a put up, shut up year for, mm. uh, for, for the team and um, coach, coach um, must champ, which I think, um, I think they're going to do a great job of getting the job done. It's going to be a tough year, but I think uh, getting the job done, not having to focus on Clemson. I mean, I'm so happy. I'm actually happy this, this game is not taking place because I care less about it. That I spoke on the rivalry for many years. Mm. Like I think it's just a um, it's a fan game. It's a fan game, but it's 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 a morale killer for for uh, the team because you're thinking, man, okay, uh, we got to play Clemson at the end of the year. You know, for Carolina, who've been getting whipped all these years, and that game is like a is like a game that you got to think about, man. When we got to end the season at, at Clemson, so this year, not even thinking about those guys. And just focusing on what really matters, the SEC, winning the East, and possibly if we win the East, having the opportunity to face those guys in in, in a playoff game, if, even if that you know that's going to be available this year. Yeah, I, I think you make a great point on the Clemson game, Savelle, because you know I, I'm disappointed it's not happening, and just from the tradition aspect, and selfishly, you know, be, me being in my position creating content, it's always fun bantering, going back and forth with Clemson fans, but. I agree with what you said. I mean, I, I think it's definitely a fan game to an extent. And I think that, you know, I mean, I'll tell you, I see people on social media. I saw people when the schedule came out that, you know, fans saying that, oh, we, we shouldn't even play a football season if we can't play Clemson. And I'm just like, that is the – it's not the attitude that I agree with. Um, and, I, you know, I think that, you know, that's the attitude that, you know, Steve Spurrier tried to eliminate. You know what I mean? I thought Spurrier tried to eliminate when he got there. He said he ripped down all the beat Clemson signs and he – the emphasis needed to be on winning the SEC because if you can do that, you're going to beat Clemson more often than you don't. So, I mean, yeah, I think it makes sense. But I'm excited either way. I want to get your perspective as a former player, Savelle, because, listen, we're not going to have packed stadiums. I mean, I think Ray Tanner said last week he's thinking maybe just north of 20,000, and I think that's probably being optimistic. I mean, can you imagine as a former player, could you imagine running out to williams Bryce and there being 15, 20,000 people in the stands? Like, I mean – Again, you got to go out there and do your job and play, but we can both admit, like, the crowd, the atmosphere plays a lot into what college football is. I feel like that would be such a weird thing, um, 
you know, for a former player like yourself? Yeah, it, it would be weird. I, I mean, honestly, um, <clears throat> I, I at twenty at twenty thousand fans in in William Bryce, if the seating if the seating is not um, too spacious, which which we never know how how they're yeah. going to play things. I, I can remember one of the loudest games I probably played in, and you would think it would be, you know, Tennessee or, or, or LSU, Florida, one of those games, but it was actually in Arkansas, Little Rock, um, mm-hmm. where we played Arkansas in their small stadium, not Fayetteville. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think that stadium may sit 45,000 fans. So when you think 20,000 fans, you hear the spring game when we got only <laughs> five, maybe five to, to 10,000 fans, and it still gets, still gets a little – loud when someone makes a good play that's all you need you know um to make to make things happen i mean the xfl they don't play in front of more than twenty thousand mm-hmm. people a week so i mean it's been it's going to be no different than that i mean and and putting the ball on the ground and, yeah and 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 coming out ready you got you got 11 on the other side 11 on one side it's still football, whether whether you know it is done in practice, wherever it's done, you got to play the game. And I just think that if we can go out and just um, take advantage, I think it's going to be great for us. You know, having a new offensive coordinator, um, not getting that much time to practice in these things, to be able to be in a quieter environment, to where we can make adjustments and come right. With it. Yeah, I, I was going to say. I mean, I I know you'd probably never say it. I, I know current players would never say it, but you know, I think the fact that you're playing an SEC only schedule is going to certainly help because I feel like a lot of the times you need the crowd is like those smaller games where maybe you're not as hyped up. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, you bring the same intensity every game I know, but realistically the crowd does help them. But like you were saying, I mean, if you're, if you can't get fired up to play when you got Auburn or Ar- any SEC team lining up across the ball, then yeah. You need to get your pulse checked for sure. Yeah. There's no yeah. doubt. Yeah. If, because those guys are going to play football regardless. Yeah. And, and like you said, man, they play this schedule that we're going to play. I mean, if you like, there's not going to be a, 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 a cakewalk. You know, mm-hmm. there's not going to be a cake, a cake game that we're just going to show up and just beat the, beat the heck out of, of the team across, of, across us. Um, so, you know, it's going to be a tough, tough schedule, tough year. It's going to be, you know, but I think also, with it being a uh, all SEC schedule, you know you're not going to have your team. Your teams just actually go through the SEC without without a loss or without two mm-hmm. losses or, or something like that. Two losses, right. maybe, because every like you say, every week in the SEC you can be beat, and this year is going to show <laughs> mm-hmm. that you can be beat. It's not the ACC. It's not the cakewalk ACC teams that that. You know that the Clemson is playing and everything like that, but you got this. This year is going to be a challenge. You know, playing against um, every S, almost every SEC team there is. For sure, Savelle, it's been a great conversation. Last question before I get you out of here, and I know it's probably a tough question, but when you look back on your career at South Carolina, is there one memory or one thing that sticks out to you as maybe one of your favorites? One of my favorite memories. Uh. I think I would I would say probably my favorite my favorite memory was um probably uh being in actually I, I didn't play. Um it was the Tennessee game. Uh, the Tennessee game where I had just ruptured my Achilles the mm-hmm. Vanderbilt game and those guys went to Knoxville and being watching it there and those guys, you know, a lot of them saying, Hey man, we're gonna get this one for you and mm-hmm. um we you know, we love you and things like that and to be in the whole like in the hotel that watching that game and to see, you know, see Josh Brown hit that field goal and, and Sydney doing the uh, the double clutch slant and over top with Blake got it to him and win that game and and the phone calls and messages after that game, that probably was I would say probably the probably most highlighted win or anything victory at at, at the school that I can remember. That's sad to say, but <laughs> You know, because I don't have really uh, great memories of of, of, of of Carolina football. So, you know, right. but that would be, be the one that I would say that I, I enjoyed the most. For sure. Well, Savelle, it's always a pleasure, man. You're a great friend. What you're doing with B for, BU for you is awesome. And uh, I know everybody's glad to hear you're doing well and everything. So, Savelle, it, like I said, it's always a pleasure, man. Glad to call you a friend. And, hey, let's keep our fingers crossed that we're going to have – that college football, the plans are going to go through – Fall camp starting August 17th, kick off the 26th. Fingers crossed everything runs smoothly and we get what we all want this fall, which is football. So, 
football. We need it, baby. We, we need, need it, it, man. We need All it. Right. <laughs> Savelle, appreciate the time, man. Let's definitely do it again soon. All right. Sounds good, bro. All right. Perfect. So for, for Savelle Newton, I'm Chris Phillips. We appreciate you guys tuning in. And we'll catch you next time on the episode of the Spurs Up Show.